Morning, church. Is this on? Are we on? Good morning, church. There we go. Okay, if everyone will please find their places and then rise to the hearing of God's word. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to read from Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let us pray. Father, let us not harden our hearts, but let our hearts be softened to, uh, to the conviction of your spirit and uh, to the authority of your word. Let us sing out with uh, joyful and thankful hearts as, as your word uh, reminds us to. Lord, let us not become familiar with, with church or with you in any way, but Lord, let us just recognize how great and mighty and powerful you are and how worthy you are of our worship this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'll just leave it there. Good morning. Um, So I want to talk to you guys again about Thrive. So Thrive is a retreat-style event that the junior youth is doing in June. It's going to be June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Um, All the students are going to come here. We've got, we invited 20 local churches for their students to come as well. We've got Reckless Revival. We've got Audio Prophets. We have speakers from Branson coming, like it's going to, we are hoping that this is an amazing event for them. Um, A couple things is the first one, we are doing a walking taco take home lunch today. So it's it's a youth fundraiser lunch. Um, We're going to have it set up there as you leave. You'll just grab a box and take it home, hang out and eat it here, whatever. Um, This is so, we're doing these fundraisers for this event so that we don't have to turn any student away. The cost is $60, and that's a lot to some to some families. And some kids don't even feel comfortable asking their parents for that money. And we want this to be an event that every student who wants to attend is able to. Um, we've got this fundraiser and then two more before our event. So um, just consider, you know, five bucks goes a long ways. Um, and then the other thing that I need from you guys, right now, we have an amazing response. And thank you so much if you have signed up to help with a host home or in a kitchen. I see you. Um, or um, any way at all to be a leader. We appreciate that so much. However, we have zero host homes that are willing to take boys. So um, <laughs> dad of one of them's laughing. He knows why. <laughs> but um, we would appreciate it. We have leaders that will come to your house with the boys. So even if you're just like, I can't stay up late with these boys. I can't, I can't like keep up with these boys. We have a leader that will go to your home and make them behave and make them respect your things. But all we ask is that you consider opening up, you know, if you have a living room or an extra bedroom or, you know, someone was like, well, can I put a tent in my backyard? And I was like, they do stink. (laughs) So just consider opening up your home. Please let them shower. Please feed them Saturday morning. But if you don't let them shower, it's at your own peril because they're sleeping at your house. Um, So please consider this. If that's something, if you want more information or you have any questions about it, please come talk to one of us. Um, It's the Briscoes, the Eppersons, and myself and Josh. And we really appreciate it. These, I know that they seem crazy. They seem wild. They sit in the back on their phones talking. 
Um, but they are an awesome group of kids. And if you don't know the junior youth very well and you're like, I don't even know who our sixth through eighth graders are, please consider this because I'm telling you, it is a rare group of kids that can trade. We went to an event. They traded a paper cup for two pizzas and a thing of Gatorade. Like, you guys want to know these kids, right? They're cool. So please consider that, and please come talk to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. We are so happy you are here with us this morning. Um, if you look in the seat back in front of you, you will see a prayer card. We would love for you to fill this out and put it in the offering bucket as it comes by to let us know how to connect with you and how we can pray for you. Um, going through some announcements today, there is still a baby boy shower table out in the foyer for the Eppersons, Ethan and Rachel. Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> um, if you would like to bless them that way, please drop off a gift for them. There is a split log food pantry out in front of the church office. If you know someone who is in need of any food items, we would love to help them in that way. Today, we are having a volunteer work day. Right after service, we will be, hopefully you will grab a lunch from the junior youth, um, eat that, and then we will get to work. Bible study is tonight at 6 p.m., and I think that's everything. If you have any questions throughout the week, just feel free to call the office, look on our Facebook page, or our church website. Let's go to Lord in Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you for this day and just praise you for bringing us all here together this morning. We just want to um, praise you in everything that we do, Lord, and we're just um, so happy to be here in your house this morning. Please be with Trent this morning as he brings your message. Just open our hearts and our ears to have what you want for us this morning. We love you and appreciate you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Looks like we got a few people missing today, but it can still be a good morning. Can you guys stand up and welcome those around you? of peace and days of rest in times of loss and loneliness though rich or poor your word is true that all my ways are known to you the trial has come Beyond your hand, no step by walk beyond your plan. The path is dark outside my view, still all my ways are known. And though what peace that I have found, wherever I may be, for all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known. I do not fear the final night, for death will be the door of life. You take my hand and lead me for all my ways are known And no one peace that I have found Wherever I may be For all my ways are known to you Hallelujah, they are known Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes. 
so I praise you that you, my God, will walk with me. And though the peace that I have found wherever I may be, for all my way are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. And know what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my way are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. would have told me how good my life would get. I would have called them crazy because I couldn't see it yet. From a story going nowhere to where I'm standing now. I'm smiling because I know there's only one way. How, how good, how good, how good, God. My heart can't help but sing. How how good, how good, God, be so good to me. My sins have been forgiven, my wrongs have been erased. I learned what's so amazing about amazing grace. Yeah, this life I live is true. Every prayer I prayed was heard. Lord, ain't it just like you to give me more than I deserve? How good, how good, how good of God. My heart can't help but sing. How good, how good, how good of God. Be so good to me. From the victories on the mountain to the heartbreak valley low. I've always been surrounded by the arms of all they go. To it's time to leave this earth, for it ain't just like you to give me more than I deserve. How good, how good, how good, God, my heart can't help but sing. How good, how good, how good, God, be so good to me. How good. How good, how good of God, my heart can't help but see. How good, how good, how good of God, be so good to me. Oh, how good, how good, how good of God, be so good.
of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out. Show me the way. You guys want to go ahead and take a seat? We're going to go ahead and take off. I just want to go ahead and come forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you have given us. And let us not ever fall into the deceptive thinking that what we have is actually ours, but it all belongs to you. Not because you're God, not only because you're God, but because you have purchased us and reconciled us back to you and we owe everything to you, God. We should freely want to give you everything. And so Lord, I just pray that that every person would not give out of compulsion or um, out of out of pressure or whatever, but that they would give out of a joyful heart, that they would determine in their heart how much that they should give and then that they would uh, give it gladly with um, knowing that that you are are worthy of it and will use it for your good purposes of uh, expanding your kingdom and for doing ministry and for saving uh, people and, and, and providing for people lord we thank you so much for for everything you're doing here at split log and we ask that you would continue to pour out your grace among us and that we would continue to be able to serve you in all of the many ways um, that we're able to here. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake Stood in awe for 
for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. When the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now the gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. In his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the
guys will bow with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can declare that today, that we serve a living God and that uh, God, I just pray for your blessings on today. I pray for uh, unity in the church, that we not be here to be as critics, but to glorify and to rejoice in you. I pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning, church. At this time, uh, kids, you are dismissed along with all of our helpers. We appreciate you serving the Lord in this way. Now, uh, everyone else, if you want to go ahead, we're going to be continuing on in the book of Luke, chapter 12. And last week, um, we we didn't make it, uh, or we only had a few verses there. Um, so we didn't make a ton of progress and that's okay. Sometimes, uh, there's, there's so much treasure to be found within the verses. And so sometimes it's okay to kind of slow down and just kind of see all of the glory that, that is there. And we're going to do the same thing again today. So, uh, we're, we're not going to cover a huge big section, but we're just going to look at verses, uh, eight through 12. And we actually already kind of hit the first two verses that we're going to look at today, eight and nine last week, if you were here uh, for Easter. So, but I I do want to just kind of go over these two verses again, because they, they go with the context of the passage. And so we need to discuss them again. And so if you're there with me, beginning in Luke chapter, or chapter 12, beginning in verse eight, And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Let us stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, this is your holy word, and we recognize it as such. We pray now that you would give us wisdom and knowledge and proper understanding of, of our passage today. Help us apply it rightly to our lives. We need you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I want to share something with you. And this is kind of, I don't know if it's embarrassing, but it is, it is something that happened to me when I was 10 years old. And I know it was 10 years old because it was the year that the, this movie came out called The Day After Tomorrow. And if you've seen it, it's basically like a movie about like the end of the world almost. Like there's this big like ice age again. There's all these like natural disasters going on. It's like way off, you know, off the charts, crazy stuff. Well, anyways, we're, you know, I'm 10 years old. I'm pretty sure that was like a PG-13 movie. I probably should not have been watching the movie, but I was. And uh, I, I know for a fact that I shouldn't have been watching it because I was not prepared for something that was going to happen within the movie that shook me to my core for years. And this is a true story. Um, <laughs> and my sister, my, uh, my oldest sister, so it's not Ashton, who's, who's over there. This is not her fault at all. Uh, but my oldest sister, Rachel, she at one time, um, we were talking about God, and and remember, I was a kid. I was 10 years old, and so um, I had come to the Lord, but she was bringing some very heavy things on me and, like, just kind of talking about these things, and I was like, I feel so uncomfortable, like, and it was conviction that I was feeling. And I didn't know that feeling of conviction, is, you know, uh, all that well. I wasn't that, all that familiar with it. I knew that I was a sinner, and I knew that I needed to trust in God, uh, trust in Jesus for for the forgiveness of my sins. And so I did that and I was baptized and all these things, but, but learning to then what it is like to be a Christian, like it was something that I was still learning as a child. And so she was talking to me about God and I'm like, I just like, I feel so weird right now. Uh, you know, and there was this, this heaviness in my heart and I was like, I don't want to talk about this. And my sister, she did not mean to cause all of this anxiety in me, but she, she did. She said, now Trent, if you, if you deny the things of God, he will deny you. And I was like, 
you know, and so it's like, okay, I'm not going to deny my God, you know, and, but anyways, I kind of like shook it out of my mind and went about my day. And then in the next few days, she took me to the movies and we uh, were watching the day after tomorrow. And so this is, two, this is the year 2004 and uh, I'm sitting in the movie theaters and I, something happened. So in the movie, there's a scene where there, all these people, they're kind of hunkered up in top on top of this like tall skyscraper because a big like tidal wave had come in and like tore through the city so they're like up there and there's no way out and it gets and it's also really really cold and so they're burning books they're like in a library or something and they're burning books and this one guy uh is he's holding on to a bible and they ask him hey are you religious and he says i don't believe in god and You know, that just goes to show you that, you know, when even like when you are at like the most desperate situations, often people turn to God, even if they deny him because they know that he is actually there, you know, they and so. But anyways, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. So he's holding on to this Bible and he says, I don't believe in God. And I repeat in my head. I don't believe in God. I repeated that. And it's not that I actually didn't believe in God. I did, but I repeated it. And then I thought immediately to what my sister said, if you deny God, he will deny you. And I thought, oh no, what have I done? And I freaked out. And for real, for years, I don't know how many, like, like it, it was a, like, I would wake up in, in, in like fran- frantic type of, you know, uh, heavy breathing, hyperventilating. You know, I, I, I was constantly, every time I would think about it and it would enter my mind several times a day that I had done this thing and I would just close my eyes and say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And it was, it became a compulsive thing. That's, that's pretty miserable because I was thinking that my salvation was that fragile. That this one thing that I did and I didn't even like, I, I, I did it like, it was one of those things like, hey, don't think of an elephant. What do you do? You think of an elephant type of thing. And so like someone said, I don't believe in God. And I just repeated in my head. And, but, and I made it this huge thing. And some of you think like, well, that, that's, that's kind of ridiculous, you know. But the thing is, is some people will, will, will read passages like today. And they will read like if you, if you deny God before man or, you know, they'll, they'll read things that we're going to talk about like blaspheming the Holy Spirit and, and all of these things. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll think, oh, I have done these things. And, and they'll point it to you know, whatever, that we, we, we get so anxious and, and really our, our faith is not that fragile. Our faith is not that. If it was, I guarantee not many of us would make it into heaven. Uh, the grace of Jesus Christ is, is far greater than just a mere poor thought or a mere, uh, uh, you know, misplaced or, or stupid, say, something stupid that you've said. So let us go a little, you know, a little further here. So every person who has ever lived has rejected God at some point in their lives. Like, you know, either before you were in Christ, you're rejecting God before you're in Christ. Even after you come to Christ, we all like reject Christ at some points in our lives. Uh, like when we sin and we knowingly know, do the thing that we know is sin, what we're doing is we are essentially denying Jesus. We're rejecting Jesus. We're saying, Jesus, uh, I deny your lordship over my life. I deny your authority over me. I, you know, and, and so essentially what we're saying to Jesus is, Jesus, I reject you. In this moment, I reject you, and I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to sin. And um, thankfully, when we do such terrible things, when we... Uh, justify, you know, maybe sometimes we were talking about this in our small group this morning, you know, sometimes when we give into temptation, it's because we, we've justified in ourselves why, like, well, God wants me to be happy. He wants me to do this thing. Or, or even sometimes we, we do the evil thing. Uh, well, it's all evil, but this really evil thing where we just go, um, well, Jesus is going to forgive me. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. If I do this thing and I ask for forgiveness later, he'll forgive me. And that's a terrible thing to just flippantly throw around the death of Jesus and the grace that he offers to us by that great act, right? And so we, we do a lot of terrible things. We, we, deny God, we deny God, we sin, and the Holy, but, but thankfully the Holy Spirit 
is there to bring us back, to convict us, right? And so the Holy Spirit brings us back to a place of repentance. And the grace of Jesus is powerful enough to overcome these stupid thoughts, these stupid actions, uh, these, these, all these different temptations that we give into. And that's what I want you to know more than anything, is that the grace of Jesus is very, very powerful. So this is what Jesus is talking about in this verse. If you reject Jesus before man and stay there, that's, that's a big key. You have to stay there in this constant rebellion, this constant rejection. If you stay there, then you will re- be rejected before all of the angels in heaven, right? And there are many reasons as to why people reject, you know, God before man. Uh, Jesus says he's just referred to one of these reasons is that we fear man and we fear what man can do to us. But he says, don't fear those who can only kill the body and can't do anything else to us after the fact. So we shouldn't fear man so much as we should really fear God because what can God do? He can kill us, and cast us into hell. That is far worse. And so you should have this fear of God. Now, um, there may be times when, like this isn't necessarily always the case, but I mean, the times are coming, or maybe you've experienced these things in the past, but when your comforts are in jeopardy, right? Or your job is in jeopardy, or your freedoms are in jeopardy, and maybe perhaps your life is in jeopardy, And it's all on account of being a follower of Jesus. And the ones who fear man above God, what are they going to do? They're going to shrink back and they're going to say, oh, no, not me. I'm not a Christian. No way. And they're going to try to save the things of this life. Now, that is not what a spirit-filled Christian would do. It is not. A spirit-filled Christian would not deny God before man. But if you go, oh, no, I have done this thing. I have done this thing in the past. I have denied Jesus because maybe perhaps you're hanging out with some friends. You're making, hanging out with these group of people that, that they themselves were not Christians. And you were like, I don't want to be judged by them. I don't want them to think uh, less of me or whatever, to think that I'm dumb. And so you just like kind of went along. And you're like, yeah, I'm not really into all that Christian stuff. I'm not really into all that Jesus stuff. And but now you're like, oh, no, what have I done? Well, You need to know that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to save you from your past rejections and denials of Jesus before man. That's the good news. But what Jesus is saying here is meant to be a warning to us that if you continue to deny Jesus before man, then that is contrary to what a saved person would do. And according to Jesus, on the last day, on the final day of judgment, you will be denied uh, before the angels in heaven. But it's not too late. If, if you're there, if you're in that point where like you've done this thing, it's not too late to repent and come to, come to the Lord. Now, something that I think that we should address when talking about like, confessing you know, Jesus is that just because you claim to be a Christian doesn't mean that you actually are. There are plenty of nominal Christians alive today. A nominal Christian is a Christian who is a Christian in name only. And that if you look at their lives, They're not actually following Jesus. To be a Christian is much more than just claiming to be a Christian. It is is a thing that that is, is, is happening in the heart. And what is in the heart then overflows outward and and pours out into the conduct of your life. Because you can say all day long that you're a Christian, but if there is no godly fruit, if your life looks nothing like Jesus, if you're not actually, you know, continually conforming your life to the word of God, then you don't really have any confidence that, or you shouldn't have any confidence. You may have confidence, but you might, you may, you you may want to reevaluate your confidence and consider, have I truly put my faith in the Lord? Because if you have, your life ought to look more like Jesus and less like the world and less like you were. And these are hard things, and no one likes to look at themselves and look at all the, all the things that they're doing wrong. And it's not about, are you doing it wrong? It's about, are you being faithful to God? Like, when you mess up, are you, are you turning to Jesus? Or are you just, like, flippantly saying, like, eh, you know, the grace of Jesus abounds, you know, like, no big deal. That's, that is not good. When you sin, you shouldn't feel so hopeless that you're like, oh, I've lost my salvation. Your 
<laughs> your salvation is not that fragile. But when you sin, you should say, oh, that is a very grievous thing to the Lord. Let me go to him in repentance. That is a, a, repentance, true repentance, genuine repentance is a sign that you, are, that you have salvation. And sometimes we think, oh, if, I, if I've sinned, that's a sign that I'm not saved. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes if we sin, it's, it's how we respond to that sin. It's, it's the next steps that we take. Are you going turn to turn to the Lord, or are you just going to continue on in your sin? So to truly acknowledge Jesus before, you know, before, G, or sorry, to truly acknowledge Jesus before man is, is, is far more than just saying you're a Christian. But let me add to that a little bit. Uh, to acknowledge Jesus is also uh, ha- has to do with your words as well. And some people are limited in what they say about Jesus. So this is how, this is how they will limit uh, what, what they say. They'll say, oh, yeah, I'm totally cool with Jesus. Like, I, I, I believe he was a real, real good person, but they don't acknowledge that he was the son of God. They'll, they'll acknowledge that he was a good moral teacher. They, maybe perhaps he had a lot of wisdom, but they denied the miracles of Jesus. They acknowledge that he was crucified, but they may deny that he was actually physically resurrected. And to truly acknowledge Jesus before men is to unashamedly say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe he lived a perfect life, completely void of sin, that he was crucified on the cross, and he took on the sins of the world, and he died in our place. And on the third day, he was literally physically resurrected. And that if anyone, and if anyone comes to Christ in faith, they will receive the grace of Jesus Christ. And that person is then forgiven of their sins and restored to a relationship with God. That Jesus has done all of the work necessary for our salvation. That there's no other work left to be done. It's all been accomplished. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it's finished. It's done. That's the gospel. And the good news of Jesus Christ, it's for everyone. To acknowledge Jesus is to acknowledge that, is to acknowledge those things. Now, moving on to verse 10. At first glance, (laughs) verse 10 is, is going to seem incredibly intimidating and difficult. But when you really dig into what Jesus is saying, what do you, if you really dwell on what Jesus is teaching here, you're going to discover that there is a ton of grace, a ton of forgiveness, honestly, a ton of unwarranted love for messy, sinful people. So look with me at verse 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now I'm going to get to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but first let me, you know, let me point you to something uh, at the beginning of the verse. That's that everyone who looks at this verse seems to just kind of skip over and then just kind of get to like the, the, the jarring parts, the thing that is, is unforgivable, right? And it kind of shakes us to our core. But first, let us look at the, the, the first part. Let us not skip over that. Uh, he says, if, if, if you ever say a word against me, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, right? If you, he says, if you ever say a word against me, I will forgive you. And that's really good news because there's a lot of people out there who said a lot of terrible things about Jesus. And one day, they will be in heaven because they have repented and Jesus forgave them. That is incredible. And even after you come to faith, if you're a saved person, sometimes there there are Christians who in a fit of rage or frustration or despair or even, uh, you know, know, a great sense of mourning, they'll say something stupid about Jesus. And and what Jesus says here is, is you can still go to him and be forgiven even though even though you don't deserve forgiveness at all, you can say something wicked against Jesus and he'll forgive you. Because it's not about what you deserve. It's about what he has accomplished for you. And what he has accomplished on that cross is greater than anything you have done. Now, if we think about the religious leaders, we think about the religious leaders in Jesus' day at this time, 
they were consistently speaking words against Jesus. I mean, it was an ongoing thing. And why were they so against him? Well, because Jesus was just this, you know, this podunk, normal-looking guy, right? He was just this normal-looking guy from this loser town called Nazareth. And they hated the fact that Jesus hung out with drunkards and poor people and criminals and rejects and social outcasts. He hung out with the hurting and the sick. And the fact that, that he hung out with the people that they were actively trying to avoid uh, really upset them. But more than that, they hated the fact that Jesus was coming and undermining their teaching and their way of life. You see, Jesus, he was bringing something new, a new covenant in his blood. It was no longer going to be through works of the law, because that could never actually save you, but it was going to be through trusting in Jesus Christ alone, who fulfilled the law on our behalf. And they did not like that. They didn't like to admit that they themselves were sinners in need of a Savior. They thought all they needed was someone to come in and to be a great military leader and save them from the oppression of their enemies. But really, they needed a, a, a great Savior to come in and save them from the oppressive, you know, uh, you know, spiritual forces of darkness and our sin and all these difficult things that we have no power to fight against. You can fight against other people. You may, you may die, but you, you, had, you had some, you know, percentage of a chance to fight against sin and the spiritual forces of darkness you have none that's that's the savior we needed we needed someone to save us from those things and he uh, and that's why he came so the religious leaders they would speak evil things against jesus they would they would say look at, at jesus walking around with, with with you know with those drunkards he's probably a drunkard himself you know look at that jesus hanging out with all the rejects like Congratulations, Jesus, you're, you're the most popular kid of, of all the losers. Way to go. You know, you really pull it off. You know, I mean, they're just horrible things. You know, they, these, these guys, yeah, maybe they were lowly people, reject, but they weren't losers. It was, that's, that's not horrible. They were, they were they're, they're people made in the image of God. The, the only people who, who thinks like someone is a loser is that, that, that comes from an evil place in our hearts. You know what I mean? Jesus, he saw them for who they are. They, 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 are, they are people made in the image of God. He loved them. And he went to them. But they're like, yeah, all those losers out there, all those, all those poor people, all those rejects, those, those sinners, the drunkards. Jesus, he's hanging out with them, and, he, and he's the most popular guy of them all. And so, awesome, good for you, Jesus. And then, you know, he's like, look, look at this Jesus guy. He claims to be the son of God. But he's just, a, he's just a weirdo from Nazareth. Like nothing, can good, no, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. You know what I mean? But Jesus says even, even these, these terrible things said about Jesus can be forgiven. You can speak a word, word against the Son of Man that is evil and not right, and yet you can be forgiven. You can deny him altogether and repent and be forgiven. That's crazy. Yet it's the gospel. And Jesus isn't just making this claim he, he actually did this. He actually did this. We have a perfect example of this by a guy named Peter. In the Bible, you guys probably know the story of Peter and what he did. He denied Jesus three times. And this is significant because, because Peter, he loved Jesus. He followed Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He had eaten meals with Jesus. He had spent a lot of time with Jesus. He was all in with Jesus. And actually, at one point in Luke chapter 9, we, we saw a while back, when everyone else was just saying that he was a teacher, you know, he was a, a, a prophet of old or whatever, not the Messiah. No one was claiming that he was Messiah. When, when everyone was saying all these different opinions about Jesus, Peter is the one who says, no, Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Simon Bar Jonah, you know, bless are you, Peter, because uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but but my Father in heaven has, you know, like like he was he was in these like he 
he was experiencing the, the, the spiritual blessings of, of being with Jesus and walking with Jesus, and he was enlightened to see who Jesus really was. And yet when Peter, he sees Jesus get hauled off and beaten and put on trial, all of a sudden someone comes up to Peter and someone's like, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Aren't, aren't, aren't you with Jesus? And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> I No, no, I think that someone looks a lot like me that's hanging out with them, but I just have one of those faces. I get mixed up with a lot of people. Um, it's not me. And then someone else comes up to him and says, hey, is that, are, I'm pretty sure, I could have swore I saw you with Jesus. Are you, are you like in, the, in that Jesus camp over there? And he's like, oh, no, not me. I, I just, we, we know the same shirt guy. We, we wear, we're wearing the same shirt. We just look a lot of like, it's not me. Um, and then someone else comes, like he just can't catch a break. Someone else comes and then says, you were with Jesus. I know it. And he was like, I do not know that man. I do not know that man. Three different times Jesus rejected, or I'm sorry, <laughs> three different times Peter rejected Jesus. <laughs> like how my, my, I don't know if you heard that, but I, was, I, I, I messed up. And my wife said, mm -mm, nope. <laughs> that's a good wife that's right three different times Peter denied Jesus Peter failed to acknowledge Jesus and that by the way if you, I mean that's an epic failure to I mean this, this, this is your savior going to the cross to die for your sins and you're like I don't know him and you have probably felt like an epic failure in your life Several different times and several different moments of life. I, I know that I have. All the time I feel like an epic failure. And, you know, we, we all have those moments where we go like, like, I've done this great thing, this terrible thing. Like, how in the world could God for, forgive me? How, how could he still love me? If, even if I pray to him, is he even going to hear me at this point? Like, I've done so much evil. I have been so rebellious. I feel so unworthy in every single way. And I bet you that's a lot like how Peter felt. And you know what happens later on after Jesus is resurrected? Jesus, he goes to Peter and he looks on him after he denied him three times and he says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then Jesus goes on to make Peter a foundational piece of Jesus' church. The Apostle Paul is another example. He persecuted and murdered Christians. Paul was a, a Pharisee, uh, one of the religious leaders of the day. He knew of Jesus. He knew the claims of Jesus and, and what people were saying about him, that he was the Christ. And, and for a season, Paul denied him. Paul denied the, 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 the preaching of Jesus. But while Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, the risen and ascended Christ came to him, revealed himself to him, and Paul repented and believed, and he was forgiven. And Paul went on to establish many churches, and he wrote most of the New Testament. So these people who, these two people who, who denied Jesus and have done terrible things, they were restored. They were forgiven and restored. Because Jesus says, you can do these things, but if you come to me, my grace is sufficient even for these things. That's amazing. And so you need to know this morning that whatever you have done, you can go to Jesus. And he will look on you and he will say, you are forgiven. Don't think that God can't forgive you for that abortion. Don't think that he can't forgive you for the fight that you had with your spouse or that affair, that affair that you had. Don't think that Jesus can't forgive you for how you treated your kids poorly or for lying or for lusting or for stealing or for murder. Whatever it is, the blood of Jesus is greater. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. That is where all our hope lies. It's in the blood of the lamb. So Jesus, he wants you to stop carrying around the secrets and the shame and the guilt and all that. He just wants you to lay it all down, even though you don't deserve it. 
But that's, that's grace. And, that's, and it wouldn't be called grace if it was something that you deserved. Lay it down and he'll forgive. Okay, I'm skipping some stuff, cutting some stuff out of my head. Let's look at verse 10. The second half of verse 10. So, read it, I'm just going to read it again. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So I've spent a lot of time, like a ton of time, so much time that I was telling my small group this morning that I feel like I'm an expert in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit at this point. Not that I uh, am 100%, maybe like, uh, I, I, there's, there's no possible way that I could, I could be wrong about this. I could. Um, but I feel like, you know, I know just about, I could, I could be on a stage with some scholars and talk about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit at this point. I have, I have read all of their works. I have watched all of their sermons. And I'm like, here you go. And it has been so difficult because honestly, because I'm like, I, I just let go of everything that I knew about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And said, I try to look at it with fresh eyes and go, what is this? What is Jesus talking about? What does this mean for Christians today? And so I hope, that, I hope that all of my many hours of effort will, will pay off, and maybe this will help you. I hope it will. So a lot of people, they'll get really, really anxious about this because they'll be like, okay, you just told me that God said that he can forgive me for, for any sin that I've committed. But then all of a sudden, now there's this, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven. And so what's up with that? Are all sins able to be forgiven or, or not? It's like, is there this... Is there this thing that I can actually do that will, that will cause me to, to, to cut myself off from, from the grace of Jesus. Now, we're going we're gonna to go through this, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you slowly through it, but one thing that I think that you should know from the get-go is that I don't think that this is something that you should walk around fearing every single day of your life. You don't have to walk around every single day fearing that, that, you, that at any moment you might commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But I do think that it's something that we should be aware of. So that, that's, all that, that's all that it is. Be aware of this. So Jesus, he basically says that there's two types of people. There are forgiven people, and, they, and um, they're, they're forgiven because they've received their Savior. They accept the forgiveness of Jesus, um, and you know, all that a person has to do is, is come to Jesus in repentance and faith, and, and they receive the grace of Jesus. And the other person is an unforgiven person. And this person does not have forgiveness, but not because God is unable to forgive them, but because they resist forgiveness. Okay? So you have one person who who accepts the salvation offered in Jesus, and you have another person that rejects the salvation offered in Jesus. And let me show you just kind of how this happens. So the blasphemy, to blaspheme means to speak against God, right? Again, if we look at the religious leaders at this time, they were guilty of this. They saw Jesus doing miracles. They saw Jesus literally raise people from the dead. They saw Jesus heal the sick. They saw Jesus cast out a demon-possessed man. And yet, when, what, what did the really, religious leaders do? They, they, they didn't go, they, did, they, they didn't see the amazing works and power of Jesus and go, wow, this guy has been anointed by God and he's casting out demons by the power of God. No. In fact, they do the exact opposite. They reject the, the evidence right in front of them. And they say, this man has an evil spirit. He's doing these things by uh, the power of Satan. I mean, at this point, they have received so much revelation that if that Jesus coming and claiming like he's the Messiah, they would they should be able to, to, to say, you know what? I wouldn't have believed you, but the things that you're doing, the evidence is so clear. There's no way that you're not the Messiah. That should have been the response. But that's that that wasn't it. Instead, they, they say he has a spirit of Satan. So instead of acknowledging who Jesus is, they hardened their hearts and they denied who Jesus was. Listen, this is is an important thing. They willfully, wide-eyed, rejected and slandered the work of the Holy Spirit. These people, they had clearly seen, as clear as anyone could, what, that, that Jesus was performing these incredible things by the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet they defiantly insisted 
contrary to what they knew was true. They knew that this that Jesus was, was the Messiah at this point. They knew that he was casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they said, this is not the Savior that I want. And they denied him. They said, you're doing this by the power of Satan. And so this was not a one-time momentary slip of the tongue. And sometimes people think of it like that, that, that they could just at any moment of any, at any part, like one day you might just wake up and just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's not how this happens, okay? This is a persistent thing, a lifelong rebellion in the face of undeniable truth that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one who was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is an important observation. Um, this is not something that uh, a Christian will commit by just a, a careless word. There's actually like a challenge. And, and people are, are they're misunderstanding the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's, the, it's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit challenge or whatever. And it's, it's a social media trend. And people get on there, usually like atheists and all these things. And they'll get on there and they'll, they'll say terrible things about the Holy Spirit. Because they go, well, if God was real, I'm going to say all these terrible things and he's going to, he's going to show up. He's going, to, he's going to punish me in some way. And, you know, actually some of them have, have the, thus then done that thing and then come to faith in Jesus later on. So just there, that's the evidence that that's not exactly 100% what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Okay? So a careless word, a stupid thing, Jesus can overcome those things. But... This is, has to do with a calloused attitude over time, a life of persistent defiance that hardens the heart to a point of no return. And that's a scary thing, a point of no return. You're saying that there's a point of no return? Yeah, that seems to be like what the, what the Bible is saying. When this group of Pharisees said that Jesus was a, was a person possessed, or I'm sorry, when this group of Pharisees said that Jesus was a person possessed by a demon, in face of all of the evidence that was before them, it was like the height of their rebellion. And they hardened their hearts so much that, they, that there was just no going back after this. Their sin wasn't unforgivable because if they were to go to God and repent and ask for mercy and grace, that somehow God's mercy and grace would, would come up short. That's not it. The, what makes this unforgivable is that their hearts were so determined to deny Jesus that they have made up their mind that they aren't going to repent. They aren't going to trust in Jesus. I mean, Jesus is there. I mean, they have seen Jesus do all of these amazing things. Literally raise the dead, uh, uh, heal the lame, make the le uh, cleanse the leper, uh, all these amazing things. And he casts out the demon and then... And the Spirit is there pointing to Christ, and they say no. And all that, after every single miracle, they should have turned to Jesus, but every single miracle that, that, they, that they heard of or saw, they rejected Jesus every single time. And so it was just hardening over time, over and over and over again, until they get to this point of no return. And when, when the evidence is at its highest, they say no, I reject this. And listen, um, this is what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, verse 26, he says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So the Holy Spirit is the one who testifies to the truth about Jesus. That is one of his major roles in, in, in the ministry, in, in his ministry. So one of his major roles is, is to tell the truth and testify about Jesus. He is the one who convicts us of sin. He is the one who communicates to our hearts that we are, are guilty of sin and that we need a Savior. And he pleads with us. He pleads with us all the time to turn to Jesus, to run to Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus, to put our faith in Jesus, to surrender your life to Jesus, to worship him. But it is possible to, not, to deny the Spirit's conviction in your life. It is. And that's a scary thing. You can say, I don't need you. Jesus isn't the Son of God. Even though you know, you know, you know He is. You can say, nope, I'm going to reject that. I don't need uh, a Savior because I'm good. I'm fine without Him. Holy Spirit, you're wrong. You're a liar. I'm right and I reject you. I mean, you can do all of that. You are not beyond that. 
It's that posture that goes, I'm going to push away from the things that the Spirit of God is prompting me to say in my heart is true. Spirit's drawing these things to you, these, these truths to you, and, and you say no. And if you persist in this hard enough and long enough, it is possible that your heart becomes so hard and so callous that you never again feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you never come to receive forgiveness in Christ because you've determined in your heart and you've made it up in your mind that you're going to reject what you know to be true. And if your heart is so hardened that you don't feel, like this is the important, this is another important point. I feel like it's all important. If your heart is so hardened that you no longer feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then who is left to bring you back? If the Spirit is what draws us, if the Spirit is what convicts us, if the Spirit is what points us to the truth of Jesus, and you flat out denied Him, and you no longer hear Him, you no longer feel Him, you no longer recognize Him, who is there to bring you to repentance? There's nobody. So there is such a place of, of, of this condition, of this hardness of heart where there will be no forgiveness, but it's not like you go to Jesus and He just like stiff arms you, right? And He's like, nope. You're too sinful. You're too far gone. That's not it at all. It's that, it's that you will never come to Jesus for repentance because you have rejected him so much. So I know that's heavy. That's heavy stuff. And that's why I took it very seriously And when I was uh, studying. So if you're sitting here today and you have uh, just a lot of severe anxiety and you're like questioning in your, in your mind, like, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Well, if you're worried about it at all, that is strong evidence that you have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit because people who have truly blasphemed the Holy Spirit, like I've kind of pointed out, they don't care. They're not concerned about their sin. And so if you're already like, oh, I need to, I need, I really, like Jesus, please forgive me, please save me. I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You're, I'm pretty sure you're good. I really do. I think you're good. And, and let me explain why, right? Um, because if you, if you think you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, I mean, some people just like, they, they, they're not even rational about it. They're just like, I know, I know, I know. I don't even know exactly what I did, but I just know, I know, I know. I'm a sinful person, and, and if, if, if anyone's blaspheming the Holy Spirit, it's me, right? I've been there. I've thought these things. Like I said, I was 10 years old. I thought I had lost my salvation for good. But the answer is, if, if, you, if you come to Jesus, if, if you embrace, if you accept Jesus as Lord, that you are not blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You're not speaking against the Holy Spirit. You are agreeing with the Holy Spirit. You are embracing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, Jesus is true. You're a sinner. You need, you need to turn to him in salvation. And if you say, Jesus is Lord, and I submit to him for the forgiveness of my sins, then you have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit no matter what you have done. Because if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're never going to come to Jesus. And if you're coming to Jesus, that means you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. It's kind of this hard argument to explain. So if you come to Jesus, you will be forgiven always of all sin. The point is there is a place where you can deny the spirit so much to where you just never even come to Jesus. I mean, listen, so listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by or except in the Holy Spirit. And so you may have one point said, Jesus is accursed. You probably didn't say it in those words, but it's kind of a weird way to say it now. But like basically you're saying Jesus is, you know, he's, you can say he's, he's uh, not worthy to be praised. Like he doesn't, uh, he's not real. He's, he doesn't care about you. He was just a teacher. He was a liar. He was crazy. He was a lunatic. Uh, I can't believe people actually believe in, in, in such a thing that, that if some guy dying on a cross was able to take away the sins of of the world and and you know actually i watched a, a little real you know social media thing yes i i i watch those things too and uh uh they uh of course i all of all my my algorithm or whatever is all christian and it's at Chelsea, I'm like, look at all this cool stuff. And she gets so tired of me showing her all these like saved videos that I've 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 saved. Anyways, um there was a oh there was one that came to my mind and I just lost it because I was explaining all of these things. Uh that does happen to the best of us. Absolutely. 
Um, man, it was going to be a good one. Gosh. Okay, if it comes to me, <laughs> apparently the Lord was like, nope, don't, take that out. Don't, don't say that. Um, so, you know, you say, Jesus, oh, I remember what it was now. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> someone was on there, and they, and they literally said, I cannot believe that, that uh, someone thinks that they can just turn to Jesus, and it's like everything that they've ever done, does, like, it, it, it's just gone. And then it turns over to the next person, and he's like, yeah, it's kind of the point. It's kind of the point of Christianity is that everything that I've done wrong, it's, it's been wiped away. And so when, Jesus, when, when God looks on me, it's he sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. It's like I, he treats me as if I had never committed a sin in my life. Because he treated Jesus like he had committed every sin ever committed. All the sins were paid in his body, and now he's able to look at me and say, he's forgiven. He's clean. He's purified. He's justified before me. And yet, to the world, that sounds ridiculous. But it's the gospel. I'm glad, I'm glad I could remember that. Okay. So, if, if, if you're here and you can say in your heart, I mean, truly believe it in your heart that Jesus is Lord, not just saying it with your lips, not just offering God lip service, but truly believe it in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Paul says that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is working in you, then you have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You can be forgiven of dumb statements, stupid statements, things said in fits of anger or frustration, even seasons of, of, of th things said in seasons of darkness or even just in plain ignorance. Those things can be forgiven if you believe in the Holy Spirit's testimony about Jesus and come to him in forgiveness and faith. Okay, so looking on to verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So this has been, <laughs> I think, used in a lot of, like, Several times to like, I don't have to prepare for Bible study. I don't have to prepare for service. I just go up here and say whatever I want. And the Holy Spirit will he'll guide me. You know, I'm trusting in the Spirit. If you, if you write anything down, you're not trusting in the Spirit. Um, that's not true. Not true at all. Um, this, this isn't even like, l let me prove to you why it's not true. Um, he's saying, when you get brought before uh, the synagogues and the rulers of the authorities, he, Jesus is speaking to his people and he's like, you are going to be taken. You are going to be arrested and you're going to be brought before the authorities. And when that happens, you're not going to have time to prepare what you ought to say. But here's the thing. When that happens, don't be anxious because the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And in those times, he will give you the words to say. He doesn't say when you have all week to prepare for a message and you have all week to prepare for a Bible study, just ignore all the time that you have because the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And if you even look at that Bible, you're not trusting. Because no, God wants you to search for him. He wants you to seek for him. He wants you to pray. When you go, when you're, if you have the opportunity to teach ever, to lead a Bible study, to lead a prayer group, prepare that's not not trusting in the Holy Spirit. Because I do, I do all these things. I prepare all these things the whole time saying, God, please, by your Holy Spirit, help me in my preparation. I don't think of my preparation as being separated from this work of the Spirit. And then I go, okay, Jesus, I did all this work. I hope it works for you. No, I'm preparing and I'm saying, God, Guide me in, in every thought, in every word that I write down. Guide me in all of my thoughts. And then when it comes to time to actually teach, and I mean, I have spent a lot of time with God. And that's how we ought to be, people who spend lots of time with God. And I, I guarantee you, God's going to be able to use you a lot more in these times of uh, where he's going to bring words to your mouth if you actually have read some of it before. <laughs> It's going to seem familiar to you. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to seem foreign coming out of your mouth. And you're like, oh yeah, I do know those things. Because that's, that's what the Spirit's going to do. He's going to bring reminders to you of, of arguments that you've heard, scriptures that you've read, and that you've stored in your heart. 
So the, even though we today aren't, aren't necessarily uh, at the risk of being dragged before the court system all the time, right? Um, even though that's not a, like a, a real possibility every single day of our lives, we still are faced with just, you know, this out of the blue, hey, why do you believe in Jesus? You know, and people kind of challenging us uh, for our faith. Like, and if you don't believe me, I, I know that you do, but here, here's an example. Like, hey, how in the world can you be a Christian uh, and, and, and be loving? Because, I mean, you guys are against homosexuals and um, you guys are against people who are just trying to take care of their bodies and they're just looking out for themselves, looking out for their health, all these things. And you are there and you're like, you know what? Like, maybe I am a bigot. It's because you don't, because you haven't like really thought these things through. But guess what? Here's the thing. If you, if you do get in a situation like that where you're just like, you have no idea what to say, trust in the Lord. Be praying the whole time and say, God, I, I don't know how to answer this question. It seems like I'm stumped, but I know, I know that you're loving. I know that you're good. I know that what they're saying is wrong. I don't know how I know, but I know that they're wrong. And I know that you're good. Trust in the Lord. And, and, and it's okay to even just say at times, you know, I don't know how to answer that question. But let, let, let me get back to you. But so often I've seen the case that God really does bring these, these words uh, these things to say in the moment, because I tell you what, I am not a very eloquent speaker. Some people will say that they am that I am, but it's only because they haven't actually heard good preaching. And I'm not that good of uh, eloquent of a speaker. See, I'm more like Moses in the wilderness, and I'm like, I need a buddy to speak for me, uh, but I don't have a buddy to speak for me. So. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing is Jesus' point is just, hey, don't, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about what, what you got to say in the moment when, when, when you're pressed out of nowhere. Don't be anxious. The Spirit is going to be with you. And so one thing that I want to I point out before we close, I promise in closing, is I want to point to uh, that to Acts chapter 7, and we see a person named Stephen who is the first martyr of the New Testament church. And the reason why I want to point out Stephen is because his life completely reflects chapter or Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. I mean, it's his whole, the end of his life here, it just completely sums up everything that we have seen so far in chapter 12. It's incredible. So this is what happens to Stephen. Stephen gets dragged before, you know, you know this is after Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, the Holy Spirit's, like, come, and the, the church is flourishing. And, and, and Stephen, he is doing all of these amazing things in the Spirit. And uh, uh, the, the religious leaders, they, they, they pull him in to, uh, to question him. And they, they, they uh, I just lost another word. I am really struggling today. Um, they accuse him. Good. That's the word I couldn't think of, accuse. I told you I'm not an eloquent speaker. They accuse Stephen of, they accuse Stephen of blasphemy. Same thing that they accuse Jesus of. And so they accuse Stephen of blasphemy. And before the religious leaders, without having any time to prepare, Stephen, in the Holy Spirit, his face is shining like an angel. And so it's evident that he's, that he's speaking in the Holy Spirit. He, he gives this incredible summary of the Old Testament. And then listen, but I mean, I don't want to read it all. It's, it's like the whole chapter. It's really long. But I want to read the last bit. In Acts chapter 7, 51 through 53, he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who have, or you who received the law has delivered by angels and did not keep it. You who received the law has delivered by angels and did not keep it. And so he says, first of all, he says, you guys have rejected the Holy Spirit, right? It's like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Like you guys have continually, always, all the time, rejected the Holy Spirit. He says that. He, he accuses them of that. And 
Then he calls them out for killing the righteous one, Jesus. Stephen, like, just look at his life. He didn't buy into the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He did not fear those who can only kill the body, but he feared God and he said the words of, of God in the face of great danger. He acknowledged Christ before man and he called them out for rejecting the call of the Holy Spirit. And he said all of this by the power of the Holy Spirit when he was dragged before the authorities. Stephen did exactly what Jesus taught in Luke 12, 1 through 12. And in the end, Stephen was stoned to death and the Lord received him. He did not fear man because he worshiped and he followed after the one who conquered death and promises us eternal life. And then so we may not be dragged before authorities, but you will be challenged by people to defend your faith. So during those times of very, you know, great difficulty, uh, when, you, when you don't have time to prepare and they, they, they come suddenly, when, the, when that happens, do not be anxious, but trust in Christ that through the Holy Spirit, he will give you the words to say. And remember that you're never alone. The Spirit is always with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that, uh, that you're, you're, you are so good, you are so merciful, so gracious that you forgive us of, of things that just seem inconceivable, that we could, that, that people can, can actually say things, blasphemous things against you, against the Son of Man, and be forgiven. Lord, let us not harden our hearts to your word, but let us uh, be convicted by the Holy Spirit and not put this conviction off. Uh, because we know that, that if we can, that if we deny you, if we, if we put off this conviction, that our hearts can actually become more calloused and more hardened over time, and we do not want that. Lord, if, if we need uh, if, if we need to repent of, of, of these things, of, of being slow to respond to your word, convict us this morning and let us lay everything that we have done in the past out down at your feet uh, where we know that we will receive your grace. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and respond to God in worship. Thank you for being here this morning. So remember, before you leave, we have a take-home, like walking taco uh, youth lunch. So I uh, encourage you to support that and grab a bite to eat there. And also, if you can stick around, if you have some time afterwards, we're going to be doing just a few things around the church. Let me just give you a little rundown, like, hey, because some of you may be like wondering, like, is this even something that I can do? Um, one of the things we'd like to do is, is, is clean the baptistry, a little, a little dirty. Um, it's not like sin. It's not because of sin being washed away. Uh, Jesus actually takes care of that before uh, baptistry. 
or baptism. So that's not it. It's just dirt. And uh, we need to clean that up. We need to pick up some sticks around the property. We need to clean out a drain. We need to paint a wall and change out some batteries and some smoke alarms, things like that. So if you can stick around, um, I think if we have enough people, we can knock it out in probably in under an hour. I don't know. Uh, I'm just guessing. So uh, it, we'll just meet downstairs in the fellowship hall and kind of plan some things out. And but but take a minute to eat. So eat first and then gather together if you can stick around. And now I'm going to ask Thomas, can you pray us out? Thanks. If you would please bow with me. Lord, we come before you today just truly humbled by your word. I pray that you just continue to soften our heart to your conviction. I pray that you would go with us as we leave this place today. We just thank you for everything that you've done with us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.